A delightful old tale speaks of a shoemaker from the town of Dublin in Ireland who falls into a deep sleep and has a fantastic dream. He dreams of a faraway bridge in a faraway city, and hidden under that bridge is buried treasure. As the shoemaker wakes up, he realizes exactly where that bridge is and exactly in which city it is. So he quickly packs up and heads out. After days of traveling, he arrives at the bridge. The shoemaker hides in some nearby bushes and starts spying on it, wondering how he can get to the treasure or even where it could be. A local woman whose custom it was to feed the birds near that bridge each morning notices the shoemaker. So she hides in some other bushes and starts spying on the shoemaker, spying on the bridge. Growing impatient, though, she approaches the man and taps on his shoulder. Ah! The shoemaker screams, startled. I've been watching you, and you've been watching this bridge for hours. What exactly are you doing? And the shoemaker sheepishly replies, Well, see, I had this dream. And in the dream, I had this vision of a treasure that was buried under this exact bridge. (laughs) Laughed the woman. You believe in dreams like that? If I believed in dreams like that, I would believe that there is a treasure hidden under the bed of some shoemaker in Dublin. The shoemaker, wide-eyed, shakes her hand furiously, thank you, thank you very much, and then rushes home. When someone asks us where we want to be in our lives, often the last thing that occurs to us is to look down and say, oh, here, I guess, since this is where I am. We miss the possibility, even the treasure, of where we are right now. Jacob, of course, has no time for such questions. There's not even time for him to pack. He rushes from home because his whole messed up family has finally imploded. Jacob and his twin brother Esau both vied for their father's blessing and inheritance in his old age. Jacob's mother had colluded with Jacob to get it, and though the scheme worked, it enraged his brother to the point that Jacob fled for his life. He runs as far as he can to a seemingly random place between Beersheba and Haran, looks for anything that will make for a pillow, which turns out to be a stone, and promptly falls asleep, exhausted. Sometimes the appropriate response to desperation, wrote Cole Arthur Riley, is to do the unthinkable. Close your eyes. Jacob's dream is vivid, a ladder reaching from earth into the heavens, angels ascending and descending on this bridge between realms, when suddenly the holy is there promising Jacob a previously unimaginable future. Sometimes dreams introduce an alternative path. Jacob awakens to such and into a world of paradox, Truly, the Holy One is in this place, and I never knew it. How awe-inspiring. Jacob reaches for his stone pillow, which now becomes the base of an altar. He names the place Bethel, or House of God. A stone-turned-pillow-turned-altar. A dream-turned-vehicle of deeper knowing and redirection. A nameless, in-between place-turned-named crucial, sacred place. Jacob, this exiled one to whom God is present and promises to be present forever. Ricard La Gallienne said that paradox is simply truth standing on its head to get our attention. This whole scriptural narrative reads like that to me. And why I think it rings true, whether it happened or not, It shatters presuppositions and insists on the possibility of such encounters, so get ready. Or as Barbara Brown Taylor said it so compellingly, earth is so thick with divine possibility that it is a wonder we can go anywhere without cracking our shins on altars. 
Sometimes truth only comes to us through embodied experience, through the experience of dreams or through the embrace of a tender lover, the kindness of a stranger, a conversation with someone who thinks or believes differently, or through the soles of our feet. Touching the truth with our minds alone is sometimes not enough. Solvitur ambulando, it is solved by walking. One of my mantras when I'm stuck. Well, what is it? Start moving, and it will present itself. But sometimes far less is required, as the practice of dreaming might suggest. Susan, my longtime pastoral mentor, passed along words to me years ago from the great spiritual teacher, Dallas Willard, who said, hurry is the great impediment of a healthy spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Indeed, an important practice in the face of exhaustion or malaise or stuckness is to lie down. One of my favorite experiences in the world is getting into that half asleep, half awake space. You've experienced this glorious state, yes? Maybe you're in it right now. There is something in letting our defenses down, putting to bed our calculating minds for a few moments that makes us more receptive to what in our wakefulness is obscured from perception or understanding. Who knows how many days Jacob had journeyed from home, but any semblance of lucidity or peace or presence visits him in the vulnerability of sleep. Speaking of her grandmother, Cole Arthur Riley writes, even someone who is direly overworked can close her eyes for two minutes and by the mercy of God find those seconds stretched out into years, allowing the healing and regeneration she deserves to come in a blink. To rest is a special kind of power. The Korean-born German philosopher Byung Chul Han ends his book, The Burnout Society, with a haunting observation of so many of us in the Western world. They are too alive to die and too dead to live. Truth. Stand on, stands on its head to get our attention. The practice of dreaming holds its own paradox, the chemistry of activity and passivity. And the two are not mutually exclusive, but two sides of the same coin or pillow. Often in the passivity of sleep is when we actively awaken to new truths, possibilities and yearnings that become sacred pathways. And when we are awake, we are so often asleep, which is another way of saying we are numb or aimless or living only on the surface of existence or simply tired of the bitter and unjust realities of our time. So many in places of privilege and power keep making it harder for people to live or to get ahead or to breathe truly free. Gutting hard-won pillars of freedom like the Voting Rights Act and reproductive rights and life-saving health care. We justify our ecocide through the plunder of Earth by the rate of value produced for shareholders. While people are dehumanized, their labor reduced to the expendable means of endless productivity. Particularly troubling for this Christian pastor is this dangerous intermingling of church and state in which the church has given up its moral voice to speak truth to power in love in exchange for cheap political power, power that seems to grow less loving by the day, less like the compassionate, self-giving Christ it follows. 
What is loving about forcing beliefs on others through posters in classrooms, bearing scriptures we don't even heed? The irony could not be greater that the first of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me, appears now on legally required posters what Christians consider legitimate loving expressions of their faith in and worship of God, while children's stomachs growl with hunger. Serious question. What God are we actually worshiping? In these hot mess times, as Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis calls these days, we need to dream more than ever. Awaken to alternative paths than the nightmarish one we're on. This week I read a study of dream reports that Charlotte Barat documented of a cohort of friends and family in Germany between the years 1933 and 1939. Fascinatingly, those who would later conform to the Nazi regime's policies and demands had begun to conform years earlier in their dreams. And those who would later resist and fight them began to do so years earlier in their dreams as well. Barat's fascinating work demonstrated that dream reports can indicate the internalized impact of social and political life long before the individual is aware of the impact. And that dreams can also attest to the preparation of the internal self for later reactions to societal and communal change. On Juneteenth, last Wednesday, I reread Harriet Tubman's recurring dream that she had dozens of times while she was enslaved and before she made her incredible journeys back and forth to free others. She would dream of flying over fields and towns, rivers and mountains, looking down upon them like a bird reaching at last a great fence or a river, she would become fatigued each time and begin to fall. But each time, a group of women were there and in their arms would bear her up and pull her across. In her dreaming, was Harriet Tubman's preparation of the inner self for the deep wisdom and courage that she would summon for her journeys ahead. It is a dream instructive for all people who believe in freedom. Do we believe in dreams like that? Chiani Tree, a dedicated member of our choir and community, dreamed into being an organization called the Inclusion School that helps people and businesses transform their workplace culture, reimagining diversity, equity, and inclusion work that centers our stories, experiences, and sense of belonging. Across all my work, Chiani wrote, is one thread that weaves through, and it's my desire and sense of responsibility to be who I needed when I was younger or in moments of vulnerability and need. Do we believe in dreams like that? It took many years for Jacob, but he dreamed of reconciling with his brother, Fearing over a decade of anger and resentment and estrangement, he resists going home. And yet, as he lies down to sleep on another night at a place called Penuel, another dream tells him that the time for his return had come. And something extraordinary happens when he goes. Esau meets him weeping as the two embrace 
apologies are made, gifts of repair are offered, and Jacob says, truly, to see your face, Esau, is like seeing the face of God. Some dismiss stories like Jacob's and say, ah, they were all dreamed up in the heads of some ancient scribes. But do we believe in dreams like this? If I believed in dreams like this, I might believe they could happen in my life, under my own bed, on my own pillow, and in our time and place too. So set out and do the unthinkable when the world makes its ceaseless demands of you, your time, and who you are to be. Close your eyes and dream. We'll witness heaven and earth kiss, and we'll name these places together and mark them with stones. Amen.